Hello, my name is Violeta Zhohovska and I'm from Electro Music. I am here in Berlin with Juliana Hodgkinson, a composer who is uh, known for works that combine instruments, objects, electronics, text, voice and different kinds of other media. So I would like to talk about what interests you in the music, like what there are topics or materials, thing, what fascinates you in, a, in your composition uh, practice? Oh yeah, okay, well, I guess that's already two things, because what interests me in music maybe is always something in the future that I haven't done yet, and which I maybe haven't met yet. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think, you know, like a lot of artists, there's this imaginative kind of uh, thing that we're working towards, and, and I, we throw our interests kind of ahead of us and, uh, and then work towards it. And then, the, you know, the, there's the thing of what you actually do <laughs> in the start of my work or in the start of my career. I was working very much with like one thing at a time, you know, it's, it's just this on its piece and it's just that. And that for project. example, what it was? Yeah, so I went in a really big way for like feathers or... Feathers. Yeah, matches mm -hmm. or silence uh, or pauses, you know, so all of these things. And it, of course, that's not the only thing that happens uh, in those pieces, but they're very uh, stubborn about having a, a particular focus. Mm -hmm. And then there's other things arranged around that main. And now, uh, yeah, because I worked with this and with that, and da -da -da, so now it's more about trying to get some kind of either multi-layered uh, way for them to be together, mm -hmm. or um, yeah, just the thing of getting older, that <laughs> realizing that life is uh, pretty complex, uh, and and so without wanting to go for complexity mm -hmm. as a style, but still seeing that you know getting a lot of things for people together in a place around an idea or a sound or a moment, is, is, there's a lot going on. So. Okay, you mentioned about the silence. Uh, do I remember correctly that you wrote a dissertation about it? What's interesting about a false start it was an instrument, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, what's interesting about not finding a multiphonic straight away, but having to kind of look for it uh, and asking an instrumentalist to do something that maybe is going to take some time, maybe it needs them to pause or hesitate for a moment and then find a sound. So I had been working ar around this idea for, for a long time and, and then at some point I was uh, with these uh, matches, I was, on a, I was on a workshop where I was, uh, everyone was a composition workshop and uh, everyone was writing pieces for oboe solo uh, and I had some matches and I started working with the matches just like the flame, it has time, it has uh, a beginning and an end, uh, has mm -hmm. a nice sound. Uh, so I started work working with these matches and it ended up with a piece for oboe and matches and again it was all about the fact that that this, uh, uh, you know, around this match there is darkness, you know, and then there's light and, and there's also uh, before the beginning of the lighting the match, there's also a kind of silence, and then when it, mm -hmm. when the flame dies out, there's it's also gone. Um, uh, and this working on this piece led to a series of pieces like that. And at some point, my working method was just so dark and difficult. You know, I was like doing productions where you're just like basically yeah in the dark the whole time. And I decided then to go into an academic space with that question, why does that interest me so much? You know, like it's mm -hmm. just too much for me and everyone else to work in this way, but what, wh why do I, why am I not finished with it? So yeah, so I, I did a PhD about that. <laughs> okay, yeah. Yeah. and uh, I had the impression you were talking about a specific piece, which is called lightness, right? Yeah, so years later I returned to the idea. So this family of works that I've just been talking about, um, uh, yeah, the longest one is called uh, All the Time. There's a, there's a series there, and then I dropped this idea as I went for the academic approach. Years later, I, uh, I returned to the idea. Uh, I was invited by some percussion players, speak percussion in mm -hmm. Australia. They got in touch with me, and, uh, and we sort of worked out that we could go back to that idea now with amplification uh, and look at, because it has always been the problem with scalability. Uh, a match is visually very small, mm -hmm. uh, and the sound, yeah, something about the sound of the sound is, you know, has, uh, has a certain kind of volume, but the interesting thing with the flame, it also maybe sounds in the quiet bit quite interesting as well. 
So, so we, we returned to, to the idea and, and that became the piece lightness and that was a more of a kind of integration of, uh, it's, not, it's not a piece in any way for electronics, but it's just using the amplification as a mm -hmm. kind of commitment to, uh, yeah, using technology to kind of support something which otherwise is a fairly kind of naive and, and primitive idea you naive? Know, to work what with naive? or just to work with the flame I mean it's kind uh -huh. of you know okay back to <laughs> it's very visually impressive like this flame the burning yeah I mean of course we are all fascinated by you know by by that we all mm. have a response to fire flame as uh, in, you know especially when it's under control as something warming and positive and and, and so on As you mentioned, um, you work not only with instruments, but also with different kind of objects. Could you tell us more about this? What, what you use, what interests you, and wh how you're looking for this object? Mm. Yeah, so again, there I started uh, uh, around the same time with the, with the matches. There was a thing with feathers. It's the quietest object when it falls, in, you know, mm -hmm. like, but it, has t it also has time. Uh, it has a kind of performative potential, <laughs> you know, like it does something and people like to watch a feather fall like we like watching mm -hmm. snowfall and so on and uh, from from there I also started to work with dropping objects so which objects sound then nice when they fall small metal objects mm -hmm. uh, is something on the floor to to receive them maybe bowls or a metal plate or something and I started just to sort of work work in this idea if for, for years and years I've just been working with dropping things it's very obvious to me that that's kind of a, also a musical parameter to, mm. to, to work with. If I take the matches as, as an object, I can say, okay, working for really a number of years with matches, it's become all about control and mm -hmm. very uh, sort of skills-based performance. Um, and uh, other objects that I work with can be more like something that a musician takes really for the first time thinking of this as a musical instrument. And so, yeah, it maybe it's a more expressive mm -hmm. use of the object uh, until they start to bring their musicianship behind that expressiveness and think, okay, but how do I do it so I can do it the same every time or do it different every time or do it more? How can I scale that up or scale it down? And suddenly it becomes again. So there uh, is a shifting in thinking about this object and this uh, sounds which it make. Yeah, and it's, su it's super interesting. I also uh, done a few pieces uh, uh, working with Foley artists mm -hmm. um, and uh, so yeah, and a lot of percussionists, of course, or other musicians as well, have a relation to Foley. You know, there's some overlap there. And Foley interest. means... Um so Foley, uh, yeah, these days there's, there's the kind of uh, manual Foley and then uh, digital Foley, but um, it's like sound effects mm -hmm. uh, for originally for radio and then for, and film. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, in silent film, putting in... I, w I worked with a, a film from the 1920s, one of the first films made by a, by a woman, Germaine de, de Lac, um, mm -hmm. and I was asked to do a soundtrack for it. Uh, so, yeah, so I had this silent film, and, uh, and I took a lot of uh, uh, kind of cues from the, uh, from the film, went to a Foley studio, um, but then instead of kind of just literally trying to make mm -hmm. the horses sound like horses and the footsteps sound very like... very cosmetic situation. Yeah, then, then I could sort of run with the idea, okay, so mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be... It's a surreal film, I don't have to stick to being illustrative, you know. This is a great day for any composer when you get a chance to work in a Foley studio and with Foley, Foley artists, uh, both the manual mm -hmm. and, the, and the digital um, experts. Um, but that's also carried then on to my uh, work for concerts or installations uh, and what my work with musicians, um, asking them to, you know, just like respond to objects uh, in this way, which could be very concrete or could be abstract or let's mm -hmm. see where we can go on that spectrum. I would like to ask you about how this creating music process looks like from the inside, how you work with music, like what needs to be done uh, to, to start new piece, how you gather your ideas to start thinking about new piece. Uh, you yeah, know, there is a real life. Uh, for me, it's also full of children and 
uh, and all the other things that we do as adults that we want to do, need to do. Um, mm. And uh, and I ha I've ha often had a dilemma about uh, how can I put all of that to the side and then do my, you know, and as you find that more difficult to put, for example, parenting or uh, yeah, being all those other things you need to be uh, in order to clear a space for composing, I, I realize that I just have to put them together. Uh, yeah, maybe if I don't have time to clear my head, then I will mm -hmm. take the music that my children are listening to. You know, it's going to be that computer game, you know, that Nintendo or whatever that goes into, uh -huh. you know, that that's going to be my point of reference or that's why I try to get annoyed about that I can't get it out, you know, uh, and this, uh, you know, like so younger children, they have this need from lullabies for something diatonic, you know, okay, so there's going to be something diatonic here, you know, later than his teenagers and then it's something else, you know, composing is very much about, yeah, bringing things together, it's putting things together mm -hmm. uh, and maybe less about creating them, le less about uh, feeling like this is my, uh, this is my melody harmony mm -hmm. motif uh, way of doing things, but more like I found these things, uh, I found them in my drawer, but I found them in somebody else's drawer. I found them, uh, yeah, on the internet or whatever. I found it, it came towards me walking down the street, uh, field recordings, uh, all these things. Uh, yeah, my job is to put it together or to bring it together or to let the listener bring it together. Just put them there. Maybe the listener needs to sort it out. Mm -hmm. Maybe I don't have the control today, this week, this year, uh, to resolve all the you know, the things that are not resolving here, maybe I just put it there and uh, just make it happen mm -hmm. and somebody else is going to find out the meaning or if there's integration or if there is, um, yeah, if there is flow between these things or not. <laughs> uh, you mentioned about uh, being a parent, so I'm curious how being a mom influenced your work? Like, uh, I'm thinking about exactly one particular piece I had turbulence and this uh, mother-daughter relationship. And uh, if you could tell us more about this. Yeah, ab absolutely. So uh, turbulence was, uh, I was invited to, to the project by some Australian friends and colleagues who I had worked for, worked with, together with um, on, on other pieces in, in the past. Uh, and uh, the libretto uh, by Cynthia Troop mm -hmm. um, came to be about mothers and daughters uh, and I guess they invited me also because they knew that I would have this, you know, very, uh, you know, a lot to uh, draw on there. Um, uh, and we, we, we discussed a lot uh, about those relationships. Um, and uh, yeah, exactly during the time of the evolution of the piece, that's when I had my daughter, uh, my second child. And I knew that oh, if we're going to do this production, I do actually need to take her to Australia. There's no way around it because uh, I'll be breastfeeding mm -hmm. in any way I wouldn't want. OK, so she's uh, she's in it somehow. There's no way around. Uh, she's in the recording. She was in the background of the production. <laughs> it had to be OK. It's a, it's set on a plane. It's mm -hmm. like a, um, uh, so it's an electronic uh, chamber opera. Uh, the mother is a singer and the daughter, uh, who is kind of cast as a kind of teenager, mm -hmm. uh, is an actor who just uses her voice for speaking, or that's to say when she sings, it's as an amateur uh, and the mother has this very controlled voice and has problems then being normal and just speaking. So she has control and beauty and mm. uh, maturity and all of this and the daughter uh, has you know pure raw expression <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah so in in this um, uh, in the, in this opera it's it's set in a in an airplane and the idea mm -hmm. is that the claustrophobia of this flight you can't get out of and uh, the boredom uh, of being in a relationship that, that maybe something doesn't change about the mother and daughter relationship or the parent child relationship it's just there. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, at the same time, you know, you come across it, you stimulate it in different ways from both sides, you know, with different kind of antagonisms and solutions or moments of actually understanding each other. Mm. Um, so all of this was, of course, for, for me at that time, it was looking very much into the future um, uh, as far as my own daughter was concerned, but I'm also a daughter. 
Uh, it was absolutely uh, generational. Uh, and I found it so in, found, it, found it so meaningful to go into that space as an artist and uh, and think why yeah why uh, uh, which art can take me there like where are the points mm -hmm. of reference that that help me kind of with all of those emotions expressions uh, and the musical professionalism of mothers and daughters' voices mm -hmm. you know when they speak when they argue when they love each other and you know when they care and all of these different this range of expression in that uh, the vocal expression in that relationship between mothers mm. and daughters um, so it, this was this was just a really great project for for me to be in but it was exactly that thing of like how do i organizationally s resolve this thing that actually is a really bad time to be doing an opera <laughs> um, but on the other hand like may, may, if i can't if I can't do an offer about mothers and daughters when I'm having my daughter, then what, you know, when? <laughs> so I just need to find the way for the work uh, and the process to uh, be fruitful for each other, uh, rather than thinking that I need to kind of, I have this part of my life and then I have that part of my life and, and I have to go between them. Mm -hmm. So you just combine two of them and it sounds like a family piece. <laughs> Yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I also have an impression that when it comes to your pieces, that uh, participation, this uh, act of engaging audience, inviting listeners to be a part of the piece, is a huge topic. Am I right? Yeah, not just for me. I think for 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 many people uh, working in the arts, participation or even not working in the arts, you know, participation mm. is is the thing of our time. Um, but particularly maybe with uh, with music, uh, you know, leaving the frontal stage auditorium situation and yeah, it's uh, a very divided situation. Yeah, yeah, so working working in a different way, uh, yeah, is just endlessly interesting f for composers, for for musicians, for audiences as well. I think audiences increasingly have a demand to be able to uh, move or choose or They're just uh, sitting still. <laughs> yeah, adjust their perspective or be able to kind of like choose their perspective. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm very interested in the asymmetry of that situation as soon as you give up the idea of a sweet spot and that there's an ideal place to sit mm -hmm. or an ideal group of seats and there's the category A and then there's the category M and that's the cheap ones where you can't. As soon as you give up that situation, mm -hmm. then you're kind of committing to the idea that, well, okay, it's going to be different for, for everyone. Experiences. Uh, a really kind of individual thing, not even just subjective, but you know, like it really uh, also objectively, like it's just like I can't be in the same seat as you, you know, and, and I can't have the same experience of, as you. So also when I uh, when I when I'm listening, I'm going to be yeah putting things together. So participation uh, at, at the very kind of at the very lowest level is is the role of the listener in performatively kind of listening it listening in an active way uh, and just yeah moving your head <laughs> connecting making the connection between what you hear and what you make of it. Um, but I also I also started to again give the audience objects Mm -hmm. uh, or threads. I mean, it's also very, very simple. It's just like the idea with working with the mattress and the flame. If you put a thread, if you ask two people to hold a thread, then they're connected. Ta -da. <laughs> uh, so working with these kinds of uh, relationality, or working with relations in a very, very literal way mm -hmm. and saying, okay, so I want, you know, these, uh, these people to be connected. Uh, and maybe there is something sonic happening in the middle, uh, an object suspended, uh, and then there's another connection running there and another object. And so suddenly you have a situation, it's, uh, it can get very complicated and tangled, literally, and tangled. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so, uh, yeah, there is a whole kind of really interesting philosophy of entanglement <laughs> in relations. Uh, um, but, but also, um, yeah, there is uh, something to do for the listener. And if... The, if the listener or the participant decides that ah, it's not really me, I'm not going to do it, then it will be quiet, mm -hmm. which is also interesting, you know. And it if is. they decide to get more active and try things out and uh, have a yeah, maybe get a ha have a, f a kind of game or play play mm -hmm. with the situation, then uh, yeah, then something else is going to happen. So something depends on what the participants do, even though they are not required to really do very much, you know, just sit there, take the thread. Uh, move or not move is fine. Mm -hmm. um, 
but I'm, I'm interested in, you know, just in this idea, uh, I, I, I'm very aware that people go to concerts with different expectations. Some mm -hmm. people really like to be passive. I know sometimes I go uh, out to a concert and I don't want to be asked to do something. I just yeah. want to, you know, listen. So, you know, that that's one end of the spectrum and the other is that one goes and wants to be, uh, you know, hyperactive in some way. Uh, so to arrange, again, a situation in which those things can happen and which they will be, we will become aware of each other's uh, yeah, connections or lack of connections mm -hmm. or a desire to be passive or active, you know, we will, we will see that played out through, um, through what happens in this piece, mm -hmm. for example. Yeah, I think it's uh, very important that you think about these different scenarios but because from the listener's point of view it could be very intimidating mm. to be part of, uh, of the piece, uh, especially when uh, a lot of people are not used to be mm. <laughs> a yeah. part of, of what's going on and like no, they don't feel invited like they are used to not be. So yeah, that's, and that's very useful and very, uh, very important that you think about these different scenarios, like for me mm. <laughs> and the listener. Yeah, but, but we know it also from, you know, from uh, installations and visual arts, mm. you know, that, that there will be some, you know, children might rush into a room and if there's something to press or something to do, they will want to do it. And a lot of other people will actually not want that, in, not, not want that invitation. Um, do I have to do something? <laughs> you know, so, so yeah, and, and, and both of their behaviors are correct, of course, you know, I think so. Yeah, we, yeah, are, exactly. all, we are all right all the time. <laughs> but still, there is a process responding or not responding, so, mm. yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, you also mentioned about the city, so I think I'm going to ask you about your another piece, Angel View, and like this amazing soundscape of Berlin. If you could talk more about this, that could be great. Uh, yeah, so Angel View arose um, at the invitation of my really good friend and colleague uh, Anna Beard Asp Christensen. Mm -hmm. We had a long, uh, a long evolution, uh, talking around what it could possibly be, uh, and uh, I settled on uh, two images uh, from Walter Benjamin. Uh, one of, I mean, one aspect of his his writing has been very much about everyday things, uh, being a kind mm -hmm. of flaneur. Uh, talking about his childhood in terms of very everyday experiences, uh, and also a book like One, Light, One Way Street, Einbahnstraße, uh, which uh, has a terrific range of uh, things in it, but it's also, uh, there, there are a lot of very kind of down-to-earth experiences from which uh, he also, which are a springboard for thinking about mm. uh, the economy, politics, society, and philosophy, and all kinds of things. And then the other thing was a, uh, a, a, a more mature uh, historical view or view of history as a, uh, as a series of catastrophes. And, you know, this is then uh, the super serious end of uh, everything, um, re, you know, regarding uh, uh, an overview of human behavior as being basically just full of one catastrophe after another and uh, the angel looking down and, and seeing humanity in this state, you know, Collapsing. so there's kind of, yeah, it's super heavy. Uh -huh. And, um, uh, and uh, again, I was drawn to the idea, maybe it's kind of, you know, tragic comic is quite a, a point of attraction for mm -hmm. me, you know, that the, the, the playful, the everyday is uh, down to earth and, uh, and then the bigger view, and I am kind of relatively pessimistic about quite a lot of things. Uh, oh, really? Know, yeah, <laughs> they're, they're, you know, so the, um, that those two things are maybe not so far from each other. One can, uh, yeah, one can acknowledge them as being quite close. Um, so, so angel view became, uh, yeah, on the one level, it's uh, lots of sounds from Berlin and uh, also very much uh, channeling Himmel über Berlin. Mm. Um, uh, channel, channeling the 80s and 90s, uh, you know, what, what was this city then? Uh, in, in my way, it's not very explicitly channel, channel, ch channeled. Um, but, but over the different iterations, it's a modular piece. It's made up of different scenes which can be put together on top of each other mm -hmm. after one another in different, uh, in different um, constellations, um, yeah, depending on the venue, depending on uh, how the musicians uh, want to do it and so on. Um, and it's also uh, modular in terms of that there are 
some field recordings and some uh, electronic uh, mm -hmm. parts and there's the instrumental parts and there's also a kind of semi-theatrical aspect to some of the scenes but really not not all of them so again it's this very kind of incomplete piece in a way it doesn't have an ideal form and it never kind of totally becomes theater or totally music or totally mm -hmm. not music is always uh, a little bit kind of uh, might be this might be that um, and uh, yeah I really I really wanted to work in in that zone of just throwing up a lot of associations without telling or giving uh, giving a sort of uh, mm -hmm. uh, without concluding how they fit together mm -hmm. and uh, I wonder how you were looking for these sounds in different parts of Berlin what was inspiring in that uh, all kinds of things. Uh, some of it is also from radio archi archives that I found on uh -huh. the internet. Uh, so I was also looking back, you know, okay, so around the 1920s, we also had the beginning of radio in Berlin. Um, and uh, and then there's, yeah, the, I looked uh, around a lot uh, for media cover coverage of the fall of the wall and uh, mm -hmm. just like looking for different kind of historical sounds uh, connected with the... Uh, with Berlin and then going out onto the street and making field recordings. Uh, and I also had a very strong image in my mind from when I was uh, 19 and I was in Berlin. Uh, okay, now everyone can do the maths. Okay, uh, 1990. <laughs> um, uh, it was just exactly after the fall of the wall and, uh, and I came to Berlin and there was the sound of uh, people chiseling the wall. Everyone wanted a piece of the wall and this chiseling sound. Uh -huh which became, it became a, a thing that, you know, this, uh, that these pieces were being sold to, uh, to tourists or taken home as souvenirs. And this got the name Mauerspechter, which means woodpecker. Mm. Uh, and this sound uh, really kind of stayed with me. And I think everyone who experienced that at the time, uh, and for me became now connected with gentrification. You know, when we hear them making those nice um, cobbled streets, uh, redoing the cobbled streets and the technique that they use, it sounds pretty much like this. It's this ting, 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 mm -hmm. uh, banging on the stone quite uh, gently and uh, uh, yeah, usually several people working together at the same time. Um, so this became, this, this is also a part of angel view, this kind of like, okay, so if we take the sound out and it's not historical and it's not to do with gentrification and we put it back just in the concert, uh, who hears what in that sound? I, I hear what I hear and someone mm. else hears, uh, or maybe they're just fixated on musicians uh, banging stone, you know, there's a kind of weird, uh, weird image of what. Um, mm -hmm. so, so Angel View became this kind of repository that I, you know, I was offloading a lot of th things that I was interested in, but, um, but the sum of them is really kind of out of my control. Yeah, but it's very interesting, like you put some of your memories from the past to this piece with this ceiling. And uh, I think because I, uh, because I was listening to this audio version, which uh, was published by Comlenio, like a new album. So I was listening to this uh, version and I had the impression that it's like a very, um, on a social level, this was very important, like different parts of Berlin, different uh, associations and how it uh, connects with this social aspect, who uh, lives in which part of, uh, of the city and this uh, gentrification topic, as you mentioned. So this was uh, very, like, very, very uh, thought provoking for me, kind of. Ah, oh, right. OK, <laughs> yeah, well, that's, <laughs> that's really interesting to hear. And I am now working on a new partner piece, Ground View, which is going to be even more down to earth and even more objecty and more kind of like on the streets today, here and now. OK, um, yeah, it's a yeah. can't wait. Yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> that would be great, like, sounds really interesting. And I wonder what kind of music do you listen on like daily basis? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, looking what's going on on the streets or? <laughs> yeah, I mean, of course, we are, we, are, we are all in that zone where, I mean, everyone who works with music, of course, in the end, we don't listen to that much music <laughs> because uh, we've, it's all full up here or we need to do something else at the end of the day. Um, uh, and so, yeah, as I've mentioned before, I think my listening is very much curated by what my kids are listening to or what they mm. also what they, you know, like it, it, you can't really necessarily f uh, fill your home with uh, experimental music all the time is, is not that good for children, like, you know, the whole time to have this uh, something super intense going on. Um, but uh, I think like like many people also 
the whole idea, I mean, the old days when, you know, I would have uh, said now, okay, the last two CDs that I bought or something, mm. it would be, uh, I don't know, Ligeti and Meredith Monk and somebody would be listening and say, okay, so he didn't say Stockhausen, no, <laughs> he didn't say Stockhausen. Um, and now we are all, I mean, how much of our listening do we actually, uh, I think on streaming services, it's only like less than 5% or something is like people actually pressing and choosing to listen <laughs> and mm. the rest is something that's in the algorithm or, yes you know there's um, a little bit different like yeah so yeah I'm also a podcast listener and uh, yeah I, ha I like listening to uh, the in from the UK Sound of Music uh, podcast and uh, in Berlin here Savvy Contemporary Mixed oh. Cloud uh, that's mm -hmm. just like uh, and, and the joy of listening in that way is that I, I go there because I know that I'm going to hear something I haven't heard before and I'm going to hear also this, uh, I mean, what we've also really um, been spoiled with these last couple of years, um, partly because of the pandemic and concerts being cancelled, but also just partly because that's the development of distri digital distribution, that the context of listening uh, digitally uh, is framed by... Um, yeah, the, the curation, uh, yeah, as you're doing now, like interviews with, mm. uh, with artists, artist talks, uh, the whole spectrum of artistic research as being a thing that's, you know, full of YouTube clips and so yeah. on. And you can, so the, the distance between uh, listening to music and uh, discuss it, hearing people discussing all kinds of topics uh, and giving it context and uh, making sort of relevance between what's what's sonically based and what's not sonically mm -hmm. based, uh, uh, archiving, re-archiving sound, thinking about history in a new way. Where's where's the new stuff in history? You know, so classical music became so narrow. It's just this handful of works. In mm -hmm. if you take it at face value, but if we look at historical music, wow, it's huge. There's so much new stuff to listen to. So so I'm that kind of listener, I think. I don't really necessarily sit down in order to, I never sit down in order to listen uh, to, to, to something. Uh, but uh, yeah, like composing on the run, it's listening on the run, you know, and I really like th that, that we have, I think many of us or all of us have become those kinds of listeners where, uh, yeah, where there is curating going on and we mm -hmm. know where we, who we want to be curated by to some extent and we're also maybe uh, ready to just take a chance or a risk um, yeah listening on the run I really like it could be the title <laughs> <laughs> yeah but I think it's important like uh, who is in charge of what we listen like is this this algorithms on this so, uh, ser as well, streaming services or there are I don't know how this is um, like uh, how much we are aware what we are listening to and uh, this is, I think, another question for, I don't know, maybe future. <laughs> no, absolutely. But it just exactly, I mean, now we're sitting here, you know, February 2022, and it's exactly uh, the moment where we realized, you know, on Spotify, for example, that uh, yeah, it's not just an algorithm, you know, there, there is curating going on and some things are let through the mesh and other things are not. Uh, you know, this, w this was a kind of great moment for realizing uh, you know, like, uh, w how, how is that actually controlled? And, you know, like, uh, we've we really got to look behind the machine of how, mm. s how some things are decided. Yeah. Um, and it's not yeah. transparent, so it's, like, frustrating in the same time. Mm. Yeah, so, I mean, of course, all of this will get more complicated as we go on. It's never going to sort of settle down. Aha, uh -huh, now, you know, now we have this uh, paradigm for our listening. But, but uh, I like the complexity that we have in our listening and I like the fact that there's a lot more, um, I, I, know, I know it's a problem that there's so much music available and that there's new music coming mm. out and however many hundreds of thousands of new, <laughs> new titles every day. I, I know that, that, that this creates certain problems, but uh, uh, yeah, but as a, as a curious listener, you know, there's, there's so many rabbit holes, it's great. Uh, yeah, and so I said my children curate what I listen to, but also, of course, my students. I, I teach uh, composition and uh, uh, I listen to my students' music uh, mm. and they also uh, recommend me all kinds of things that they are inspired by. And there's, uh, uh, you know, really, uh, there's, you know, so much renewal in that because, uh, yeah, they're a different generation and they listen to stuff I would never have found. Mm -hmm. But it's uh, hard to think about a kind of canon for recommend some kind of music from contemporary music field. 
I don't know, like uh, when I think about myself, it, it would be very hard for me to recommend somebody like what uh, somebody should listen to right now. Mm, yeah, I mean, I'm lucky that I don't teach music history, you know, because then <laughs> I would have to deliver the canon or a canon or a new canon. I guess I feel that uh, teaching today is a lot about uh, uh, producing alternative canons uh, but of course you know the fragmentation of the, when you start to uh, to do that whether you say like we need a, a female canon or we need a, a black canon or whatever you know we suddenly uh, suddenly again you know it's at some point the kind of listening desire spills into this kind of like joy of just going unknown places or new mm -hmm. places and I guess the yeah, as a teacher, maybe just to sort of like support that desire um, and send them off to find their own way. That's kind of <laughs> maybe the best we can do. Yeah, but it sounds great. Like there is a hope in the future. <laughs> mm. OK, thank you for a wonderful conversation. Thank you, thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, thank you. And if you like this episode, please leave us a comment below or hit the thumbs up button. Bye. Mm.